Welcome to Nearly Numinous. If you're listening to this right when it's released, then we are two days away from St. Patrick's Day, which means it's finally time for the podcast episode all about this super cool Celtic saint. <laughs> Jacqueline, did you write that? <laughs> I was in a really weird mood. <laughs> As you will see. Listeners, uh, just, just know that uh, Jacqueline wrote the script for this week's episode, so if it's super nerdy that's why (laughs) it's all Jacqueline's fault yeah you'll likely know St. Patrick from his feast day which is exuberantly celebrated on March 17th in Christian tradition Patrick was the first Christian evangelist of Ireland and has become an important symbol for Irish identity and unity Over the years, St. Patrick's Day has become associated with all things Irish, even if peripherally. On March 17th, you'll likely see lots of shamrock decorations, leprechauns, chocolate gold coins, green beer, and queen students making questionable decisions. (laughs) I definitely have partaken in that as a queen student. I never did. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm not really a day drinker. So I've never, like, if I have a drink before the evening I will fall asleep immediately and just be tired and miserable so I learned that very quickly in my undergrad and then just like never was into drinking during the day well that's what you gotta do during like queen's daytime celebrations you gotta like rally in the morning and then sleep in the afternoon and then rally again in the evening that's how it goes usually see what I normally do is I sleep in Mm. I do whatever work I need to do in the afternoon and then in the evening I go and have you know some drinks and hang out but in, in all fairness, though, like, typically I was usually working or, like, I remember my first St. Patrick's Day at university was when I was in second year. So, like, in first year I was abroad. But in second year I was on campus and I had an evening class that day from 6.30 to 9.30 and I had a presentation. Oh. So, like, I, I couldn't. Um, but there was a kid that showed up. I bet. Blasted. Yeah. And it was very, very funny. <laughs> I always went to pancake keggers on on St. Patrick's Day. I love those things, you know, like make green pancakes, uh, dress up, start drinking at like six a.m. <laughs> Jacqueline's giving me it's so early. <laughs> Why would you be awake at the? Why would you want to see other people that early in the morning? It was all for the alcohol. Listen, I don't drink anymore, but I made a lot of questionable decisions, especially on St. Patrick's Day back then. So. I am no stranger to the celebrations of St. Patty's Day. Yes. Ironically, though, this episode has nothing to do with drinking. (laughs) Even though I'm sure we're going to talk about it a lot. Apparently. (laughs) Apparently. So while digging into the why of many of these associations and symbols would be interesting, I'm not sure that these associations are due to anything besides basic cultural stereotyping. So instead, we're going to spend this episode looking at the man of the hour himself, who unfortunately seems to often be forgotten on his own special day. So, St. Patrick, this one's for you. So listeners may remember that I did my undergrad thesis on Celtic Christianity and that we had an episode earlier this year that looked at another Celtic saint, St. Bridget, and gave a bit of a Celtic Christianity 101. So make sure you check that episode out if you're interested. But before we get into the story of St. Patrick, I thought we'd give you a quick refresher on some concepts. Number one, Celtic Christianity is often defined as being the quote-unquote traditional form of Christianity that was practiced in the British Isles before the Roman Church took over. This is a modern oversimplification of history and often assumes a monolithic form of Christianity where historically there wasn't one. For this reason, Celtic Christianity is seen as being a new religious movement. As a religious movement, modern Celtic Christianity is often associated with art and poetry, 
nature and eco-spirituality, and feminism. Number two, both St. Bridget and St. Patrick are patron saints of Ireland. In the 7th and 8th centuries, their monasteries tried to one-up each other to try to gain their monastery more power and authority in Ireland. The phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword, aptly describes this situation, since the scribes of each of their monasteries would craft the hagiographies, which are the stories of their saints, in such a way as to give their saint especially good press in hopes that it would result in their church gaining more power and influence. So kind of like fan fiction? Yeah, I, I would say so. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> it's not a new topic. <laughs> no, not at all. So I think we're going to get more into that literary battle a little bit later, but first we'll get into the basic details uh, about good old St. Pat. If you're looking for stories about beer and leprechauns, you're in the wrong place. As much as I love a good story about beer, um, not so much leprechauns, but I, I could vibe with it. <laughs> we will talk about leprechauns a little bit later. Okay. <laughs> But you'll probably find a little bit more about beer in the stories of St. Bridget, uh, because she had more of a knack for turning water into beer, which we talked a lot about on the past episode. There are some interesting tales, though. In some legends, he is said to have turned people into goats, banished all of the snakes from Ireland, and won various competitions with druids. The persona of St. Patrick in his writings is quite different from this mythic Patrick. While we don't have any writings from St. Bridget, St. Patrick actually has an autobiography, which means that scholars are more, much more comfortable asserting that St. Patrick was in fact a real historical person. Scholars make a distinction between two Patricks. There's the historical Patrick and the legendary Patrick. The historical Patrick was uneducated, exceptionally humble, and took his Christian faith ser seriously. While the legendary Patrick also took his face seriously, he seemed to be much more headstrong, impulsive, and prone to seeking revenge. Jacqueline refers to this as the flashy Patrick, <laughs> and we'll look at the flashy Patrick a bit more later. I'm super excited to hear about him. <laughs> but the Patrick who wrote his autobiography, which is called the Confessio, was born in Banavim Tabernay, probably in Britain, to a Romano-Celtic family. He was the son of a deacon and the grandson of a priest. At the age of 16, he was taken captive during a plundering expedition, brought to Ireland, and sold into slavery. At the beginning of his captivity, he did not firmly believe in God. It was in the solitude of his work, looking after his master's flocks, that he began to pray regularly and his faith grew. After having been in Ireland for six years, a voice spoke to him in a dream, telling him that a ship was prepared to bring him home. Patrick journeyed 200 miles to the boat, which he boarded. Though in his autobiography, Patrick does not say where the vessel took him, many scholars believe he went to Gaul, where he may have spent time in the monastery there. He eventually went back home, where he had a vision of a man from Ireland imploring him to return to Ireland. Patrick may have returned to Gaul to prepare for his mission and may have been ordained a bishop. Hereafter, he arrived in Ireland, where he was highly successful as a missionary in Ireland and stayed there until his death. Now we'll take a bit of a break to hear a selection from Patrick's autobiography. As you listen, pay attention to how he portrays himself and consider what purpose he may have had for doing this. Patrick, a sinner, a most simple countryman, the least of all the faithful and most contemptible to many, had for father the deacon Calpurnius, son of the late Potitus, a priest of the settlement of Banavem Taberde. He had a small villa nearby where I was taken captive. I was at that time about 16 years of age. I did not indeed know the true God, and I was taken into captivity in Ireland with many thousands of people for we had quite drawn away from God. We did not keep his precepts, nor were we obedient to our priests who used to remind us of our salvation. And the Lord brought down on us the fury of his being and scattered us among many nations, even to the ends of the earth, where I in my smallness am now to be found among foreigners. And there the Lord opened my mind to an awareness of my unbelief in order that, even so late, I might remember my transgressions and turn with all my heart to the Lord my God, who had regard for my insignificance and pitied my youth and ignorance. And he watched over me before I knew him and before I learned sense 
or even distinguished between good and evil, and he protected me, and consoled me as a father would his son. Therefore, indeed, I cannot keep silent, nor would it be proper. So many favors and graces has the Lord deigned to bestow on me in the land of my captivity. But after I reached Ireland, I used to pasture the flock each day, and I used to pray many times a day. More and more did the love of God and my fear of him and faith increase, and my spirit was moved so that in a day I said from one up to a hundred prayers, and in the night a like number. Besides, I used to stay out in the forest and on the mountain, and I would wake up before daylight to pray in the snow, in icy coldness, in rain, and I used to feel neither ill nor any slothfulness, because, as I now see, the Spirit was burning in me at that time. And it was there, of course, that one night in my sleep I heard a voice saying to me, You do well too fast. Soon you will depart for your home country. And again, a very short time later, there was a voice prophesying, Behold, your ship is ready. And it was not close by, but, as it happened, two hundred miles away, where I had never been nor knew any person. And shortly thereafter, I turned about and fled from the man with whom I had been for six years, and I came by the power of God who directed my route to advantage, and I was afraid of nothing until I reached that ship. And on the same day that I arrived, the ship was setting out from the place, and I said that I had the wherewithal to sail with them. And the steersman was displeased and replied in anger, sharply, by no means attempt to go with us. Hearing this, I left them to go to the hut where I was staying, and on the way I began to pray, and before the prayer was finished, I heard one of them shouting loudly after me, Come quickly, because the men are calling you. And immediately I went back to them, and they started to say to me, Come, because we are admitting you out of good faith. And so I continued with them, and forthwith we put to sea. And after a few years, I was again in Britain with my kinsfolk. And they welcomed me as a son, and asked me in faith, that after the great tribulations I had endured, I should not go anywhere else away from them. And of course there, in a vision of the night, I saw a man whose name was Victoricus, coming from Ireland with innumerable letters, and he gave me one of them, and I read the beginning of the letter, the voice of the Irish. And as I was reading the beginning of the letter, I seemed at that moment to hear the voice of those who were beside the forest of Folklet which is near the western sea, and they were crying as if with one voice, We beg you, holy youth, that you shall come and shall walk again among us. And I was stung intensely in my heart so that I could read no more, and thus I awoke. Thanks be to God, because after so many years the Lord bestowed on them according to their cry. I ought not to conceal God's gift, which he lavished on us in the land of my captivity, for then I sought him resolutely, and I found him there, and he preserved me from all evils, as I believe, through the indwelling of a spirit, which works in me to this day. But it is tedious to describe in detail all my labors one by one. I will tell briefly how most holy God frequently delivered me from slavery and from the twelve trials with which my soul was threatened, from man traps as well, and from things I am not able to put into words. I would not cause offense to readers, but I have God as witness, who knew all things even before they happened, that, though I was a poor ignorant waif, still he gave me abundant warnings through divine prophecy. Behold, over and over again, I would briefly set out the words of my confession. I testify in truthfulness and gladness of heart before God and his holy angels that I never had any reason, except the gospel and his promises, ever to have returned to that nation from which I had previously escaped with difficulty. But I entreat those who believe in and fear God, whoever deigns, whoever deigns to examine or receive this document composed by the obviously unlearned Sinner Patrick in Ireland, that nobody shall ever ascribe to my in ignorance any trivial thing that I achieved or may have expounded that was pleasing to God, but accept and truly believe that it would have been the gift of God. And this is my confession before I die. So autobiographical Patrick, who's not the same as flashy Patrick, wrote two texts during his life. His letter to Croticus, a letter of excommunication for a British chief that had taken some of Patrick's converts during a raid, and his confession, which is a defense of his mission to Ireland. 
He wrote the letter earlier in his missionary career, whereas he wrote confession closer to its end. Upon reading Patrick's text, one is struck by the utter humility with which he presents himself. Due to his captivity, Patrick did not receive the education he would have otherwise obtained as the son of a deacon. Therefore, his Latin is shaky at best. In contrast, Patrick knew his scripture well. His writing is at its strongest when he's citing scripture or using scriptural phrases as a base for his sentences. In fact, there are more than 200 biblical quotations in his 80 paragraphs of writing. It is when he starts writing about his feelings, an area in which he probably didn't have much practice, men am I right, <laughs> that translators have struggled to interpret his meaning. This self-conscious Patrick, again, not the flashy Patrick, <laughs> who introduces himself in the, his, his letter to Crotacus as a sinner very badly educated, and in his confession as least of all the faithful and despised in the eyes of many, in his confession is far from the same Patrick of later myth, the flashy Patrick. <laughs> it is, in part, his poor writing and his humility that allow scholars to credit these texts as a true autobiography. No future biographer would have chosen to write about him in such a way. That's true. My journals aren't that sad as his were. Yeah, it's very he seemed very down on himself. <laughs> yeah. Patrick viewed himself as one of the last apostles, honored by his realization that he, in spite of his ignorance and in the last days, should venture to undertake this task, to declare the Lord's gospel as a testimony to all nations before the end of the world. He saw himself as a witness that the gospel had been preached as far as the point where there is no one beyond. It may sound like Patrick was promoting his own importance, but since Ireland was at the farthest edge of the known world, it was reasonable for Patrick to assume that the world would end once the evangelism of Ireland was complete. This eschatological view is not the motivation of his mission, but provided reassurance of its importance. While Patrick does certainly seem self-conscious about his education, this is not the only reason he wrote about himself in this way. This piece is a confessio or confession, which is a piece of writing commonly written by Christian leaders including the most famous by St. Augustine. In these texts, the authors weave their theological musings with their own autobiography. In doing so, they often emphasize their own faults with the purpose of glorifying God. In conveying their fallibility to readers, they are able to assert that anything good that they did was all because of God and the Holy Spirit. This served an important function because, as we'll hear, the confession was written largely as a defense of his mission because there were those in the Catholic Church that were skeptical of his style of evangelism. So we already mentioned two Patricks, the historical and the legendary. Or the regular and the flashy. The regular and the flashy. To make things even more confusing, it turns out that scholars think there may have been more than one person who made up the historical Patrick, but that these two Patricks were amalgamated into one. So to recap, there's the mythic, flashy St. Patrick, then there's the real Patrick, A, and real Patrick, B. And presumably one of them wrote the autobiography, and he's the one who's probably from Britain. But we're not exactly sure which one's which. I'm curious, how certain are they that there are two people that made up this single Patrick? Is it just like a hypothesis, or is it like a pretty solid claim? both okay. in yeah yes well, and <laughs> yes and like there's no they don't have two bodies so they can't be like super sure what they know um what they know is from these documents that were uh written in ch churches in ireland that have different different dates for like um there's real patrick a who came to ireland ireland sooner and um, he was sent by the Catholic Church, but had a very unsuccessful mission. Um, and then he went away in disgrace, and they assume he never came back, but he might have come back. We're not, we're not quite sure. But then Patrick B. came to Ireland a little bit later, and we know the dates of when he was in Ireland. And he was, ex he was successful, but he probably wasn't sent by the Catholic Church. And we know that, as we read in um, the confession, that he ended up staying to Ir in Ireland until he died. So there's like, it could be one person, 
Okay, so it's a fact that there mm-hmm. were two real dudes named Patrick who were in Ireland for some time. Yeah. But that parts of their stories may have been put together to make... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To make the guy that we celebrate when we drink excessively on March 15th. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Which may be part of the reason why there's a mythic Patrick that has these, like, crazy stories, because we're actually talking about two different people, so we could do a lot. Although, like, the first Patrick wasn't very successful. Um, but, yeah, like, two, two people yeah. can do more than one, so. Okay, this is a total aside. Uh, we don't have to keep this in. But I find it super fascinating that in 2021, we still celebrate the idea of, like, the Catholic Church spreading Christianity throughout <laughs> Ireland. Like, yeah. I know it's, like, we've separated it completely now, and, like, St. Patrick's Day is an excuse to wear green and drink. And yeah. it's not, like, seen as a celebration. But when you really think about it, like, that's, we're, like, we're celebrating, like, the Christian colonization of Ireland. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> and, like, as we'll talk about a little bit later, that colonization was a little bit different than what we would think about for, like, other colonizations. It was, um, like, a there was, there was a lot, like, they were allowed to continue their, their, a certain amount of their pagan traditions and stuff and so it was like it was less oppressive than other um other historical cases of christianization but it like it's still yeah like it's yeah like, like it's still oppressive yeah and like that's what we celebrate and that's what we're celebrating yeah like, and, massive celebration yeah Ooh, dicey this episode just got a little spicy folks <laughs> all right let's get back to the information again all right, so why does it matter if there were two Patricks and which one was maybe more successful? So as we know, in Ireland, there's been a divide between Catholics and Protestants for as long as we can remember. This means that there's been political stakes in Patrick's religious affiliation. Of course, asking whether St. Patrick was Protestant or Catholic is a question founded in historical inaccuracy. The Protestant Reformation only occurred in 1517, whereas both Patricks came to Ireland in the 5th century. However, following the Protestant Reformation, this was a contentious issue. Patrick was in the middle of a tug-of-war as each denomination, as well as individual churches, sought to link their lineage back to him. Following the Council of Trent, which occurred in kind of the mid to late 1500s, Catholic hagiographers renewed their interest in saints and sought to standardize hagiography so as to limit any abuses. For Irish hagiographers, this was an opportunity to share the stories of Irish saints with the larger Catholic community, as well as to establish St. Patrick as their own. So in these cases, St. Patrick would have been portrayed as being Catholic. As well, during and after the potato famine, there was a rise in Irish nationalism. In the religious sector, this was expressed by Protestant and Catholic groups participating in a pamphlet war as they debated the religious identity of Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. Hold on, what does a pamphlet war look like? Because that sounds kind of fun. Uh, sounds very nonviolent. Um, I think it is just people like putting out pamphlets being like, this is the reason he's Protestant or this is the reason he's Catholic. Just like aggressively at their typewriters. Just yeah, yeah. Like- I kind of love that. We should we should bring that back. I mean, maybe that's kind of what the internet is. The modern version yeah. of a pamphlet war. With the Twitter. caps lock on. Yeah, that's yeah, true. true. Twitter is a modern version of a pamphlet war. <laughs> anyway, so now we logically know that St. Patrick wasn't actually Protestant, but how Catholic was he? So in his autobiography, it is clear that autobiographical Patrick saw himself as a part of the Roman Catholic Church and its greater mission. But did the Catholic Church actually send him? Despite later tradition saying that Rome commissioned Patrick, this seems unlikely. Rome probably would not have sent a missionary so uneducated as Patrick. Also, one would think that Patrick would have mentioned that in his confession. Some officials of the Roman Church may have been questioning his mission, providing partial insight into why he wrote his confession in the first place. Though Rome did not commission him, he still saw himself as a part of their Christian mission. Referring to those of the Roman mission, to whom he presumably is writing his confession as quote-unquote brothers. So, the Roman church likely did not identify with his mission as being Catholic while Patrick was alive. Only later, when it served their political agenda, did his apparent Roman education and commissioning become a recurring theme in his hagiographies. Thus, while Celtic Christianity was in some ways Catholic, 
it wasn't entirely so. So as we've discussed um, earlier in this episode, but also in our episode on St. Bridget, the Troubles um, is historically a very important time in Ireland um, in which there was a conflict. So beginning in 1960 um, is when the Troubles began, and the Troubles is a three-decade ethno-national conflict that took place in Northern Ireland, but also um, had ramifications all throughout Ireland. A key issue was the constitutional status of Northern Ireland and if it should remain a part of the UK or if it should leave the UK and join the Republic of Ireland. Though this was primarily a political conflict, there was, there was a divide between Protestant and Catholic. So after the end of the Troubles in 1998, there has been some attempt to change Patrick from a symbol of Protestantism or Catholicism or nationalism to be instead a reminder of a common heritage in Christ. As a statement written by the Corimila community says, this common heritage in Christ through St. Patrick creates a spirituality that predates our modern divisions and has had an influence on both Protestant and Catholic traditions. So this statement, which is which was by uh, made by Corimila, which is a peace and reconciliation organization in Northern Ireland, serves as a reminder that often the best way to work through conflict is to focus on commonality instead of difference. All right, so now let's turn more to the mythic St. Patrick, or the the, fanc the fancy St. Patrick? Fancy pants. The fancy pants. Flashy? <laughs> Flashy pants Patrick. I'm, I'm picturing St. Patrick is almost like an Elton John type figure now. <laughs> Every time we've said flashy or fancy St. Patrick, I imagine like a, a shimmy of the shoulders <laughs> along with it. I'm sure he did that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's turn now to this mythic St. Patrick. And I'm going to say mythic. So we stop laughing every time one of us That's says flashy. Idea. Yeah. Uh, you'll remember from the episode on St. Bridget that St. Patrick's mythic tales also served a political function, though perhaps to a smaller scale than St. Bridget. The hagiographies of Bridget and Patrick were sites of competition between Kildare and Arma, the monasteries with which each of these saints has been associated during their lifetime. I won't recap the full back and forth between these literary battles now, other than to just bring up the link between these saints and Irish Celtic paganism that were used by the hagiographers as a way to establish authority. On top of using biblical miracles in their stories, the hagiographers relied on pagan symbols and established systems of hierarchy to establish their saint's authority over Ireland itself. For St. Patrick, this was often done by having him battle Celtic druids with Christianity. In one story, Patrick challenges the druids at their magical arts and proves them to be powerless and then destroys their idols. This is similar to other stories in the Hebrew Bible that tell tales of similar battles between leaders of the Israelites and the magicians of other gods, such as in the story of Moses and Pharaoh's magicians. In another story, a king and his druids were meeting at the Hill of Tara, the traditional crowning place of Irish high kings, to light a fire for a pagan celebration. When Patrick lights an Easter fire on the nearby hill of Slain before they had lit theirs, which was forbidden, the king and his party confront Patrick. After an earthquake and general pandemonium, Patrick and his party shapeshift into deer and flee the scene. Not only does the story establish Patrick as more powerful than the Druids, but it also tells the story of the first Easter in Ireland. Having Patrick battle the Druids, and to also have power similar to them, establishes him and God as more powerful than the Druids, but it also puts him in a place of authority parallel to the Druids. These stories are significant because in the pre-Christian Irish Celtic societal hierarchy, Druids were the most powerful figure, even more so than clan leaders. They were a part of the learned class, which consisted of the Druids, the Philid, and the Bards. These classes had different tasks and responsibilities, though they overlapped and changed over time. The Bards were singers, poets, and storytellers. The Philid were poets, but also shared various duties with the Druids, like prophecy, divination, and teaching. The Druids and the Philid trained for many years to gain proficiency. Sources say that Druids trained for 20 years and that the Philid trained for 12. That's a long time. I'm glad. I'm glad a PhD doesn't take that long. <laughs> it can. It can. That's true. I have heard Very it. Can. I have heard 20 it. years. Could you imagine? Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. I think probably a lot of the reason why it was longer than like a lot of our education is because it was so focused on oral storytelling and I would imagine mm -hmm. that that just takes a lot longer to memorize and that's true get down but 
I don't know. Yeah. If you zone out, you have to get them to start over. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> Could you imagine, like, during the, like, the exam period? Oh, sorry, I fell asleep. Could you start again? <laughs> The Druids were the most politically influential group of their time. Due to their powers of divination, rulers would often seek their advice. They were the mediators between the rulers and the spirit world, and so held power over the rulers to keep them in check. Though the Druids had the most authority of the learned class during pre-Christian times, they began to lose this influence as the pagan system began to fade away, and many aspects of their roles got passed on to the Philid and the Bards. Scholars think that many of those who traditionally would have been druids, philid, and bards instead moved into monasteries, which had a comparable system of education and emphasis on stories. It's these people that scholars think eventually became the scribes of the monasteries, writing both pagan and Christian stories alike, often with much overlap in themes. There were other incorporations of pre-Christian culture into monasteries, too. In terms of a continuation of Druidry, scholars think that the dress of the Irish monk was a continuation of the traditional dress of the Druid, as Irish monks wore a white mantle, which Druids had worn, and also adopted a similar tonsure, which is a certain hairstyle that you can look up that's really funny. We highly recommend Googling it. Or follow us on Instagram. Maybe throughout the week we'll share uh, different images of different styles of tonsure to <laughs> show you exactly what it is or maybe if you're looking for another quarantine haircut yeah go for this mm, i feel yeah. like this would be really high maintenance though you know yeah like how mm. do you shave that how do, i don't know yeah no well it's all a bunch of dudes in monasteries that live together so i'm sure they'd help each other out yeah that's true With i'm wondering things. about so so for listeners it's either either all of the hair at the back of your head is just shaved off or there's this like weird one where there's like a triangle going from your ears to the top of the head, so it's like a headband. And I'm just wondering, like, how does the shave? I don't know. Like, how would you how would you be able to shave that and not nick yourself? Like, I'm sure you many... get help from somebody else. Yeah, but like, you know, I don't know. Is it like a ritual? I'm very curious more about tonsure now. Yeah, like, but like, do they do it as like a ritual or? And like, how often do they they do that? Well, it, it was abandoned by papal day. order in 1972. And why? Abandoned. Why was it abandoned? Why did they even do it? If you're wondering what oh, it, it looks like... Oh, it is a like, ritual. If you're wondering what it looks like and you don't want to look it up, it's like an example of is what Friar Tuck had. So that That's band of That's the Roman hair. one, though. Yeah, there's, so there's like a Roman one, there's a Celtic one. Yeah. All different styles for you to check out. Yeah, maybe I think we should do like an Instagram yeah. theme week where we just like explain what tantra is. <laughs> I love it. Edit some photos of ourselves so that we <laughs> try out the hairstyles. Oh my god. Hair bump Which that one. Imagine. Which one makes me look hottest? <laughs> Vote in the polls in our Instagram stories. <laughs> All right. Um so the continuation of pre-Christian culture and its incorporation into church practice is quite abnormal in historical instances of Christianization and is a reason that, for some people, Celtic Christianity is so controversial. It was mentioned earlier that people were skeptical of the way in which the autobiographical Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland, which prompted Patrick to write his Confessio. While scholars can't be certain why this was, many think that one of the main reasons was because the Christianization of Ireland was thought to be not Christian enough. In fact, this is a common perception of Celtic Christianity by some Christians today. So where does the importance of this question of whether or not self-identifying Christians are Christian enough come from? Christianity is an evangelical religion, which means that Christians often have missionaries that go out into different parts of the world to spread its message. The theological idea is that the gospel, or good news, of Jesus is so exciting that it should be shared with everybody. But there have been disagreements on how exactly this message should be shared. Very quickly, sharing this evangelism became a systematic Christianization that also required Westernization or Romanization. In other words, it was not enough that a region adopt Christianity as its official religion. It needed to be expressed in the correct way. The entire society had to be reshaped to reflect Roman culture. Social hierarchies had to change, methods of communication had to change, so they had to often adopt the language of Latin, 
Old ways of life were often even outlawed. In this way, Christianization has led to terrible atrocities. Of course, these areas all had their own cultural practices, religions, and folktales. Sometimes evangelists or the people themselves would integrate or translate the Christian story into this culture, a process which is called syncretism. Since this expression of Christianity wasn't a reflection of Roman or later Protestant Christian culture, it was seen as impure or pagan. As we heard in the previous episode on St. Bridget, this elimination of the pagan didn't happen in Irish Christianity. As we know, Celtic themes were actually ways in which Irish churches sought to establish authority, particularly in the mythic hagiographies we've discussed. In order for this to be an acceptable practice in Irish monasteries, it seemed that St. Patrick must have chose the method of syncretism when he went to Ireland, which resulted in a distinct flavor of Christianity in Ireland. Due to this syncretism, some Christians view this form of Christianity as not being true Christianity due to its quote-unquote pagan tendencies. It's important to note that not all Christian missionaries feel this way. Some see syncretism as a method of translation. There's even theology books that highlight St. Patrick as an example of how to do evangelism in a culturally sensitive way. These types of theologians tend to see the goal of evangelism not as cultural domination or, co or coercion, but as a genuine desire to share what they see as joyful and life-changing good news. So as you can see, the relationship between Christianity and culture is very, very complicated. So far in this discussion of Celtic Christianity, there's been a lot of discussion of what is perceived as right or wrong theologies. And if you think back to our very first episode, our introduction to the podcast, this is more of a theological approach rather than a religious studies approach. And I know I'm very interested, Jacqueline, because I know you studied, when you did this thesis, you studied at a college that was predominantly theology focused rather mm -hmm. than religious studies focused. And I was wondering if you have any insights into kind of this debate and how this came about for you during your research. Right. So as I talked about in the episode on St. Bridget, even though I was studying it, studying at a, a largely theological um, institution, I was coming at it from a religious studies kind of historical framework because I was I had decided that I wanted to study Celtic Christianity historically rather than theologically. So I was looking at it as a movement um, more so than specifically at the theology. Um, but I remember in my thesis defense, um, a more conservative faculty member derailed the question period around my research to essentially just ass assert that they didn't think that Celtic Christians were in fact real Christians. And I remember feeling very frustrated with this um, because it didn't have anything to do with my research at all. My research was just about like the history and um, yeah, just like how Celtic Christianity has changed over time and it wasn't about were these people really Christian. So for me, if someone says that they're Christian, then I believe them that they are a Christian. Um, so I would say, um, because this podcast is talking about like religious studies scholarship, so I would say that the role of a religious studies scholar is to believe people are what they say they are, and in general not do research that the primary aim is, is to disprove a belief system. Um, if someone wants to do that, then that's fine. That's the, that's theology. Just um, it's it's not religious study scholarship, and so I just found that very um, it was very confusing because um, I think I think this faculty member thought that I was doing theology when I wasn't, and so he was he was very concerned um, about the the ideas that I was I was discussing that you're like going down the wrong path or something yeah the slippery slope is uh, uh, yes. something that I've heard before oh really yeah interesting from a fellow student mm. um, not from a professor but, yeah. I think it's interesting that you bring this up um, because this is kind of rejigging in my memory I don't know if either of you remember but for one of our courses in our master's program we read something about kind of the divide between religion and science mm -hmm. and I remember distinctly that one of the things they talked about was the fact that oftentimes people assume that scientists are atheist because you know how can you possibly you know reconcile the difference between science and knowledge and you know blind belief system in religion right but what they actually find is that people who study religion are often atheists mm -hmm. and people who are scientists aren't like you find more of like of a higher percentage in religion and like sociology and kind of like the humanities that study religion 
end up being more atheist and more like atheist inclined, which I find very interesting. And I think that's like an interesting aside to like your comment about the role of the religious studies scholar. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting, though, because I find like I rarely read academic work from religious studies scholars that seeks to disprove belief systems. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes then when you ask them, like, well, what do you think? They're like, well, I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting kind of like balance of doing research respectfully yeah and i also want to emphasize that like a lot of my props were were theologians um in my undergrad and they were they were great theologians and great scholars and a lot of them like wouldn't do their research to yeah to make moral judgments about other people um so it's it's just a very particular um strand of theology i guess that like um yeah that just like goes around making judgments about other people about uh, what is right and wrong practice, um, and it's it's very difficult to read. Um, like sometimes I'm not sure if you you folks have had this experience too, but like when you're when you're trying to research something that um, maybe a lot of religious studies scholars haven't covered yet in research, and then you come across some of these articles where they're making these judgments. Um, this happened to me. Um, regarding like disability and stuff and it's just it's just really hard to read but it's not it's not like the main landscape of theological study it's just like a small Mm -hmm. often um like your small bible colleges will be the ones that will be like yeah for sure especially the ones that are very solidified in a specific theology Mm -hmm. because i even know like i've looked at doing my phd in theology um and i've looked at different colleges that Some of them, like, if you look at, like, U of T theology school, it's very broad, it's very open, like, Mm -hmm. you can kind of study whatever theology you're interested in. I've read other, like, reviews from other schools where, like, it's very specific, and if you do not agree with their theology, you shouldn't even apply. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, too, but linking this back to St. Patrick, and um, within theology, there's this, um, there's this strand of study called missiology which is the like the study of missionaries and so a lot of these small bible colleges are there to um yeah to teach pastors and to to teach future missionaries Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of scary to me that um some of these places are the ones that have this more conservative um like less what's the word i'm looking for um, like less respect, less, yeah, yeah, less empathetic, less respect for other cultures, and they are often the ones that go to these other cultures. Yeah, and that makes me very nervous. I'm not sure if we yeah. want to include that. That's but. maybe um a topic for another time. I feel like we could do a whole episode talking about like uh, missionaries. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my I did like my paper that was on African <clears throat> witchcraft. There were some papers that were like by like by these missiologists because a lot of this witchcraft will be studied by like missionaries being Mm -hmm. like what the heck is going on and they're the ones writing the papers and they're the ones making the moral judgments in their papers about why african witchcraft is apparently the most terrible thing in the world ah yes side note okay (laughs) are we ready for more uplifting this is the last thing are you ready i'm ready i don't we've been given strict instructions that we weren't allowed to look uh, at Jacqueline's trivia. Mm. Um, I find it hilarious that you added it to the shared document when you easily could have just had your no. own document <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, no, I trust you guys. If, if you follow us on Instagram, you'll maybe have seen, I shared in our story the other day, um, the thing that Jacqueline put, but she put in massive letters, leprechaun trivia, do not scroll past here. Um, the text is in white. Then she put the text in white, because I was curious, <laughs> so I scrolled. <laughs> I didn't highlight the text, Good. so I listen that much. So this first question isn't just about leprechauns, and it is about St. Patrick's Day in general. Okay, so which is true? Shamrocks are associated with St. Patrick because he is said to have used the shamrock as a way to teach the concept of the Trinity. Number two, or B. Leprechauns are associated with St. Patrick's Day because... According to myth, St. Patrick interacted with these mischievous creatures and actually ended up converting a few of them. C. 
it is archaeologically possible that St. Patrick did in fact banish snakes from Ireland, as there are snake remains that have been dated to before the approximate arrival of Patrick in Ireland, and then none after. D. All of these are false. I'm going to go with C. I feel like C is true. Snakes? Okay. I think the snake thing is true. I think A is true. You are correct. <gasps> the Trinity? So, but to clarify here, um, I realized in my writing, so my intention was actually for the answer to be D, but then I realized I said, because he is said to have used the shamrock, you'll probably in your Catholic schooling probably be told this, but there is nowhere actually outside of common myth that St. Patrick used the shamrock to explain the Trinity. So it's just, it's one of those like... Oh, uh, what's it called? Those um, it's mythologically urban. too true, but not factually yeah, true. Exactly, like urban legends. <laughs> yeah, but like not even like in, like flashy Patrick isn't said to have done this. You know, this is just like we Catholic just made schooling. that up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, like a cute little folklore tale. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, so our next our next questions have to do specifically with the leprechaun, which is not listed as a possible etymology of the word leprechaun. <clears throat> My uh, pronunciations will be terrible. The compound of the roots lu or lagu from Greek small or cor from the Latin corpus body. B. Luperci and the associated Roman festival of Lupercalia. C. Life meaning half or drug no um and brug <laughs> because of the frequent portrayal of leprechaun as working on a single shoe so brug means shoe d all of these are true i go with b b i'm gonna go with c is not true c any explanations why I can't find a link between leprechauns and Lupercalia in my mind. I don't know anything about Lupercalia. We talked about it in Pancake Tuesday. Oh, that's Lupercalia. There's so many. There's so many. There's Saturnalia. There's yeah. There are some. <laughs> in my They're mind, on, I like, <laughs> honestly, like, okay, I studied this more directly than I think mm. you did, and yeah. I still can't keep them straight. Yeah. Yeah. Final answers. Great. Oh, I guess. Yeah. You wanna? Do you wanna say? Always go with C if you don't Let's know the answer. Great. <laughs> they are all they are all actually true. Um, yeah. Mm. So yes, I we did, both lost on that one. Yeah. yeah. Wah, 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 wah. I, I think probably just because they like partying, Lupercalia. That's my understanding. Is there's partying in Lupercalia? Do oh, leprechauns I didn't realize like that partying? leprechauns partied. <laughs> I don't oh, know. That explains a lot. Happy. St. Patrick's Day celebrations are starting to make That's more true. sense in my head. <laughs> okay, know. here's my pitch. Instead of celebrating the colonization of Ireland under yeah. Christian like Catholicism, yeah, uh, we should reframe it as a celebration of Lubricalia. But doesn't that that happens on in the spring? Tuesday? No, okay. it's a spring celebration. Uh, yeah, we can just everything in spring can be Lubricalia. Yeah, that's fair. No, because remember, if we go back to Pancake Tuesday, yeah, you'll remember my rant about the fact that not everything needs to be a link to a pagan holiday. Yeah. Um, and how, like, contemporary ex-Christians like to be like, God, they must have stole this from the pagans. And my argument was that, no, in fact, Pancake Tuesday has nothing to do with pagans. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to hear the next question. Yeah. In the previous episode on St. Bridget, we talked about the Tuatha Day, or the She, who are the Fae that often lived in fairy mounds. What does not describe... The leprechaun's relation to the she. A. Leprechauns are a category of she that generally have their homes in or on rainbows instead of in fairy mounds. B. Leprechauns are strictly solitary fairies, whereas the she are more social. C. Leprechauns get up to good-natured mischief. But the she may pull tricks that are a bit mean-spirited. D. 
Leprechauns may actually be more akin to the classification of a dwarf or a household familiar than a she. C. So the leprechauns do not get up to good-natured mischief. Or, or however you want to negate that point. I'm going to go with C, too. C? It is actually A. Okay, but I felt like option B and option C yeah. countered. Yeah, that's the thing. Other. They're not. It, it's all mixed up. Um, but most do not consider leprechauns to be a category of the she. Okay. So they have like different, um, different beginnings, um, which is maybe the next. What? What? You're gonna say something? No. Um, I feel like this uh, trivia isn't fair because we just spent the whole episode being like, "There's a lot of contradictory information. <laughs> Nobody really knows anything about <laughs> Celtic Christianity." And now you're like, "Now I'm gonna quiz you on answers." that contradict each other but it's fine because they're both true because like we said there's no right answers <laughs> maybe so this next question may clarify the beginnings of the leprechaun i don't want to spoil it okay because i might like explain it hit us then... with the next question Great. Then. let's go i'm ready which is true prior to the 20th century leprechauns were often described as wearing blue instead of green B. Since leprechauns showed up late in Irish folklore, they they have always been portrayed as wearing the same style of clothing that we see them in today. C. An early version of the leprechaun showed up as part of the Tuatha Dei in the saga, The Taking of Ireland, which is a, a saga that we discussed in the previous episode. D. The earliest known story involving a leprechaun was a medieval tale where they grant a king three wishes when he catches them. Which is true. I like D. D. Yeah, I really like D. Reminds I def me of okay, genies. I definitely don't think it's B. All right, and hear me out. I do recall seeing images of leprechauns that were terrifying, as opposed to the cutesy little uh, Lucky Charms ones we know today. Yeah. So I feel like that one's not true. Uh, and you're giving me a look that makes me think that I, like, I'm second-guessing it entirely. I'm just excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell us. Tell us. We, we both say You D. were both correct. Yay! Yay! I have interesting information to share about the other ones, though. Share it. Okay. So I guess, oh, yeah, for the previous one, um, the reason why um, the beginnings are so confused is because there, there was this fairy that was, like, pre-leprechaun, and so when people think that leprechauns are fairies but they're, like, they're actually like they have very different beginnings and so it's a very confusing they I'm had not sure. very different beginnings <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> but also what i read in this this research is that basically everywhere around ireland prior to the 20th, 20th century leprechauns actually wore red yeah hmm. and it was only i could um, see that more than blue it was only after, like, immigration to the U.S. and, like, like the Irish immigrant community and this association with Ireland being green um, that, like, leprechauns started wearing green. But at the, also, so, um, so originally the dress of the leprechauns varied, like, quite differently across regions of Ireland, even though they always wore red. Um, but, like, the hat and the buckle shoes... Um, they're thought to have their origin in the Elizabethan period. So the styles of the clothes that were still being worn in Ireland in the 19th century, um, apparently, like, they would be often worn in Ireland, like, long after they were out of fashion in England. And so it was common for, um, Irish immigrants to come to, like, North America and still be wearing these clothes. Um, and so there's this association with like Irish people wearing these sorts of Eliz Elizabethan clothes. And so that is apparently why leprechauns wear what we often think of them as wearing, even though it's quite historically different. Hmm. And that is the end of the trivia. I learned a lot about leprechauns. Yeah. I previously knew no, no information yeah. except for, um, like I said, some leprechauns look terrifying and some are bring yeah. lucky charms. Um, and there's no in between. I know nothing in between that. <laughs> <laughs> so Rachel won. Two to one. Woo. Yeah. What do I get? Uh, 
I don't know, a high five. A meaningful high five. A meaningful high five. <laughs> uh, listeners, we have been told um, from some of you that it'd be helpful if we kind of did like a summary at the end just to kind of like go over what we talked about, key points, you know, interesting things. And I have a pitch for this. All right, hear me out. So I think that each of us should take one piece of information that we thought was the most interesting, the top, you know, thing that we wanted to get across and share it with our listeners. Yeah, that sounds good. Can cool. I, yeah, just like short little yeah. blips. Okay. Just like a little like, yeah. Okay, so the most interesting thing that I realized in this episode was I've never taken the time to think about the St. Patrick's Day celebrations that we participate in versus the historical St. Patrick. So I've always known like there's a very big disconnect there, but it wasn't until recording this episode that it dawned on me that we are technically celebrating the expansion of the Christian empire by drinking excessively and making our pancakes green. Um, so that's, that's one of the most interesting things I learned. I think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, whether or not you want to uh, call that colonialism or not is a different thing. Um, my biggest, my favorite thing that I learned this episode was about the different types of Patricks because one of the things that really got me into religious studies as a field was looking at the historical Jesus versus like the Jesus like you read in the Bible and all that, like who Jesus was as a person. So it's really cool to look into who Patrick was as a person. Maybe he was multiple people. Uh, maybe he was super flashy sometimes, and maybe he was super, you know, super sad in yeah, his maybe journals. maybe he was the Elton John of yeah. Celtic Saints. Maybe he always did shoulder shimmies, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I really hoped so. <laughs> and also, I know more about leprechauns than I thought. Yes. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Which wasn't much. <laughs> I didn't necessarily learn too much personally in this episode because um, this is... You taught us everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, what's the one takeaway? Like, if there's one takeaway you could give to the audience. St. Patrick is a cool dude. Is generally... Yeah. 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 Expand cool. on that. Yeah. What, what parts are cool? Well, he's, like, very... Uh, he's lots of different aspects to him. He's a very um, complicated... Um, I want, yeah, I don't know, very complicated His writing character. was complicated. Yeah, very self-deprecating. I think we should mm -hmm. all build ourselves up more in our journal writing. Not that I do journal writing, but I feel like it's like you're writing in your journal. You should, like, you get to choose what to write. Like, be positive. Talk, mm -hmm. talk about yourself nicely, you know? St. Patrick teaches us so much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I feel like we should give people some journaling prompts on how to not be St. Yeah. Patrick in your journals. Yeah, so, right? So, if you journal or if you don't journal, um, <laughs> specifically you know, how not to be St. Patrick. <laughs> how not to be St. Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, like, write, write some good things about yourself in your journal today. Don't, don't be a, don't be a downer St. Patrick. Yep. Be a, a vibrant, flashy St. Patrick. <laughs> Let's close know. out with shoulder shimmies. Yep. <laughs> if you if you if you're listening, uh, shoulder shimmy with us as we end this episode with a beautiful Celtic medley. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>